The Spin-Off Podcast Network. Tell me about your childhood. I'd rather not. Therapy. It doesn't have to involve talking. That's why we created GivenWell, a workplace wellbeing platform that lets everyone choose what works for them. It might be pumping iron, punching a bag, getting a massage, or whacking a ball. Or it might be talking, after all. And how does that make you feel? Really good, actually. It's workplace wellbeing that works for everyone. GivenWell.com This is Kiwi is back for a brand new season with more inspiring kōrero from special guests including rugby player, father and role model TJ Peronara. My family bring me joy. Rugby brings me joy too, but it's not the same joy as my family brings me. And global dancer and choreographer Kirsten Dodgen. For some reason people think I'm very intimidating. Listen to the new season of This is Kiwi, brought to you by the Spin-Off Podcast Network in collaboration with Kiwi Bank. Available now wherever you get your podcasts. No my hockey my ki other fold emihine kodan hungry talking uh I'm joined today by my colleague Liam Ratana, uh standing in for, for Glenn Kine who's on holiday and it's it's I've I've talked about this before. Uh, it's the release of Where Are the Audiences, which is which is Christmas for me. And um yeah, really happy to have you along, Liam, to to discuss discuss this with me. Kia ora. Yeah, big boots to fill, but I'm not trying to fill those at all. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, that's true, but it's, uh, I mean, there's just so much in this. It's, it's, uh, and, and you, uh, a month ago, looked at the first ever Where Are the Māori Audiences, um, which we might touch on. But what we're going to do today is, I mean, this is a stolen format, uh, like so much of, of what I've done. It's stolen from the kind of what Bill Simmons does on, on his podcast, where you essentially, draft uh the the data and um and we'll just go through where are the audiences uh 2024 which has now i think been running for 10 years and it it basically is a it's it's a massive singular survey of uh of audience behavior across demographics platforms there's nothing really like it uh it isn't as granular as specific radio, print, uh, TV surveys, but there's nothing which compares across formats like this. So it really is quite uh, highly scrutinized and sometimes disputed by by people across the industries. But um, we've, we've literally just had it land an hour ago and um, so there, there might be things we missed, but there's, there's so much that's interesting about it. Uh, Liam, I'm going to get you to, to start off by uh, picking the, the data point that left out at you first. Uh, yeah, so the thing that I couldn't ignore that was quite a big surprise was broadcast radio has increased, which seems to be a real buck of the trend. Um, if you look at previous reports over the years, Broadcast radio has been steadily declining in use, um, so it's really interesting to see that that has increased across um, across all audiences. And basically, people are spending the same amount of time every day listening to streamed music as they do to radio, which I find really quite surprising. It's interesting, right? Because you know, and th- this is what this survey is really useful for. Is I feel like when you're in a media bubble, you know, we work in a city, we, we tend to talk to other people who, who are hyper consumers of media. Um, our staff is, is relatively young and you sort of, you tend to consume media in quite a forward way in terms of you're, you're more likely to, in some respects, um, be ahead of, of what the kind of broader national behavior set is. And, and radio is a format that it just sort of chugs along, and, and every every six months they put out a, a new set of survey data, and it it always shows just a slight increase. And there's a tends to be a cynicism about that, and yet this da, da, this data is effectively testing what the um, the GFK radio survey says, and it kind of backs it up. Yeah, I remember listening to I think it was an episode of the Fold where you referred to broadcast radio as the cockroach of of media, right? Because it's always on in the car and. I'm one of those people who, oddly enough, puts on the radio when I get in the car and I'll, I'll listen to RNZ or, or even EWI radio. Um, and so it's quite interesting to see that, you know, RNZ's been overtaken by News Talk ZB, for example, and there's been a shift, especially considering, you know, podcasts are growing in, 
in popularity quite steadily. But yeah, it's it's interesting to see. I mean, it's it, it's trying to figure out attribution for that kind of thing is, is always difficult. But you sort of go, you know, there, there is this public transport use hasn't recovered um, since COVID, and you've got to think that more people in cars more traffic, potentially that's just, just more time listening to radio. But there's also, like, for example, this morning I was listening to The Edge because my, my daughter's a massive Ch- Chapel Roan fan and they were giving away uh, a ticket to see her in New York and there's some, you know, they, they kind of walked up to the person who won the door and knocked on the door and there was just this huge buzz of excitement and radio just has this, like, unifying thing in, in a, you know, because you look at the survey overall, it's incredibly splintered. And the the sort of mass cultural element that radio still has that that isn't really there for social or even for um, TV on demand, you you can kind of still feel that. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, at the pools I go to, they play the radio instead of broadcasting music, you know, streaming music, you know, or from Spotify or something. And I think there's something about sort of filling the empty space with a voice. You know, when you listen to things like RNZ. It fills a gap, you know, and can kind of create that sense of having a companion or someone in the room with you. You can keep up to date on current affairs news, have a bit of a mix of things. Whereas if you're just listening to a podcast or just streaming music, you're sort of isolated in what you're consuming. So it's, yeah, it's a real interesting sort of trend to see there. And the edges actually, I noticed, it had a 2% increase in terms of audience as well. So it's done quite well out of all the radio stations. So there it there is an element of people wanting to to consume that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, I'm going to go for my first pick now, and you know the the you know I've I've been talking about this this survey for the thick end of a decade now, um, and every year or every time it's come out, it used to come out by um, every second year. Now it's now it's annual. The big cha- there's always been some giant change, some kind of feeling of cataclysm about like an existing, particularly like a legacy medium falling and a modern digital medium rising. And and that's been, you know, often those things you can kind of see audience leaving one and going to another. This time it's kind of flat. Like, it, it, and this goes particularly for 15 to 39, which we'll talk about a bit more later. But that's been the most shocking thing to me is that, you know, across – you know the the linear TV uh, total, you know between uh, you know twenty twenty three and twenty twenty four is like a three percent change. Um, the global video sharing platform, which is the way they refer to sort of social and UGC, it's up like one percent. SVOD down a couple of percent. You know there are these things which have been on this really steep rise, which are starting to decline. Um, music streaming essentially flat, podcast streaming up like one point. So part of this, I wonder if, like, are we starting to see the end of a decade of great change and potentially a sort of a new normal where where these things have not replaced things, that they've just sort of restabilized at new consumption levels? Yeah, it's interesting, right, because obviously over the last decade we've had a great uptake of smart technology in the household, you know, in your pocket with your smartphone. And it took time for that older audience to sort of jump on the boat and start streaming videos and watching things on their phones or their iPads or at home using smart TVs. So it feels like, yeah, that's starting to finally sort of flatten out now and we've sort of reached the peak of where or how people are consuming media now, which is a really interesting trend and it makes looking towards the future I guess a bit more certain but also potentially uncertain because it's harder to predict now where those great changes might happen. We knew that people were going to continue to um, you know, pick up streaming via these services but now it's hard to sort of predict what the, the future trends might be because it is, like you say, quite flat across the board. Well, one thing that's interesting to me, I mean, we were talking um, late last week about, you know, on some level, you sh- should profile like someone who's going to be like uh, pure digital if you look at a lot of the surveys, but you're also like a really hardcore 6 p.m. news on TVNZ viewer as well, right? So the, these surveys, I think there's a tendency, and I've definitely been guilty of it, to 
as- ascribe a greater degree of confidence about a whole of demographic, which actually it doesn't really reveal. And there are still, even for younger audiences, they don't consume nearly so much t- TV as older ones, but they're still, you know, it's still a pretty large chunk. I mean, do you want to talk a bit about, you know, that, that 6 p.m. habit of yours? Yeah, so I'm a bit weird when it comes to my media consumptions. I actually had a conversation with my cousins at dinner last night about this sort of stuff, sort of in anticipation of this all here. Um, and they asked me, oh, how do you consume media? What do you watch? And I said, well, I'm a bit weird. I still watch the news at 6 o'clock, not live, but um, on demand, TVNZ on demand, and I'll flick it on pretty much every night, which isn't a habit that I've always had, but since I've jumped back into journalism, I found it quite beneficial to to watch the news. Um pretty much all the way through every evening. And I think it's part of living with my, you know, my whanau, my my in-laws as well, kind of an older demographic, and it's quite easy to just put on the news. It's kind of a neutral thing. We all seem to get something from it. We have something to talk about at night. And so that's one of the main reasons, I think, that we still watch the news. But, yeah, it is sort of um, not what a wider audience is doing, obviously, when you look at these statistics. But there is still a segment of New Zealanders who I think have some sort of affinity with the 6 o'clock news. Obviously, we had some pretty big changes with News Hub earlier in the year. We saw a sort of um, a spike in their viewership and that sort of come back down now. But still, I think people feel like there's that familiarity with the 6 o'clock news, and I certainly have it with, with TVNZ and One News. So, yeah, that's sort of the main reason that I still uh, consume you now watch the news. So that, that kind of leads us into your your second pick. Um, yeah, to just uh, tell us what what you're drafting there. Yeah, so time spent on TV or watching TV versus streaming videos on demand. So uh, New Zealanders spend over two hours watching NZ broadcasts that deliver TV content. So um, TV NZ, News Hub, that sort of stuff. But but that includes both. That's a combined stat. So that's both linear and uh, TV NZ plus, right? On, on demand. Yep. Yeah. Um, and that's on a typical day versus an hour and a half watching global video sharing platforms or SVOD, so YouTube and the likes of, of those online platforms. Yeah, that's that's quite quite fascinating, right? Because, the, 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 again, it's sort of somewhat counterintuitive. It, you know, our mental image of the, the, the modern connected TV viewer is that, you know, the a new TV remote has a Netflix button on it, has a Disney Plus button on it, doesn't have a TVNZ Plus button. Oftentimes you'll unbox these TVs and it doesn't even have the TVNZ or Three Now apps on it. There's actually an argument around that. But so the fact that they're still able to, despite all of the inertia that kind of pushes you towards SVOD, pushes you towards YouTube uh, to kind of rack up those numbers, again, it's a sort of, there's a, it's not the full radio cockroach, but it suggests that there is quite a powerful urge to kind of still to stay with these these kind of New Zealand TV products. I think again, people. If, if I look back to the where are the Maori audiences survey earlier in the year, people want to consume local content. They they like seeing themselves reflected on screen, right? And so, when it comes to the amount of local content available on the likes of Netflix it's really quite minuscule when you can compare it to what we've got available on TVNZ Plus or those local platforms. So I think people are tuning in to where that local content is for those reasons of wanting to see themselves reflected. They enjoy the content and they want to consume it more. Um, I think I agree that there's still an element of it being a sort of default when you flick on the TV to tune into Channel 1, 2 or 3. But yeah, it's a really interesting trend that the global video sharing platforms, we're seeing a decrease there and an increase in this local platform pickup. Well, that's that's kind of lends itself to my second pick, which was the, um, the that you know, they call it global video sharing, which, um, you know, it's, it's always hard, these, these kind of broad buckets. So it basically means user-generated or social video. So particularly YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook are the, are the kind of main platforms there. That's declined in... Uh, in the 15 to 39 bucket, which seems like a shocking stat. And it's only really rising in 40 plus. And what I thought was interesting about that was if you think about what's happened over the last year, it's been particularly characterized by Meta as a platform desperately trying to play catch up with um, TikTok, trying to 
turn as much of their time on platform over to video and over to TikTok style video from anywhere versus the previous kind of stills for Instagram and um, and posts for Facebook. So I'm sort of curious about to what extent that is a user preference for video versus that's just something that's happened in front of them in terms of what they've naturally been served. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, we've seen an increase in that audience in broadcast radio, podcast, gaming, music, so things like CDs and vinyl as well. But that flattening with the SVOD and also, like you say, global video sharing platforms, music streaming and linear TV all sort of decreasing at the same time. I think the time spent will be interesting to go through and analyse what the where are the Māori audiences. We saw a massive increase in the time spent gaming and so it's quite difficult to obviously stream videos, game at the same time. And so that might explain a little bit of why we're seeing this decrease. But yeah, again, it's really counterintuitive to what we would probably expect to see for that audience when you compare it to the previous reports from, from other years. We started doing a pikeha. I don't know where I'm from. Yeah, I'm going to go check with the chef. Take out kids. A coming-of-age documentary series returns for season two. From a Thai restaurant to a dairy to a nail salon, five young people balance school and relationships while growing up in their family's shops. Are you working tomorrow? I'm on school. Watch Takeout Kids on the spin-off today, made with the support of New Zealand On Air. That actually kind of takes us into that, your third pick, which is, is the... This kind of shocking thing we're seeing in 15 to 39 where, you know, which, again, mental image is these are ever more online generations. Um, but we're seeing these aren't massive slips, but we're seeing a decline in global video sharing, um, decline in on, New Zealand online video, decline in music streaming, SVOD flat, linear TV flat, New Zealand broadcast video on TV demand, that's TVNZ, et cetera up slightly radio broadcast a big jump it's it's kind of staggering right it really is it, it really like i said before it bucks the trend in terms of the the data that we've seen in previous years i think when we look at these reports or people who sort of geek out on them um you don't expect to see those areas decreasing in areas such as music or, or broadcast radio increasing and it, it really is quite a surprise to see those data points there. Again, it's going to take some more time to sort of crunch and figure out exactly why we're seeing that change. But I think a part of it might be people sort of turning away from traditional media as we know it and or going back to platforms and, and cons consumption habits that they feel more comfortable with or more familiar with. But again, it's going to take time to sort of analyze and figure out exactly why we're seeing those changes. Yeah, it's funny, right? Like you can kind of talk yourself into a number of narratives. Could it be a sort of a nostalgia? Could it be that having really bombed into that world through COVID, that there's a sort of sense of wanting to kind of rediscover these more communal type activities? But, but as you say, I think the big thing with this is like we, we've seen a sort of a flattening. Is that a trend, a new normal? Is there just a, a regathering of steam? I guess some of that will, will only become clear in future. Um, my next pick is is about uh, SVOD. So that's Netflix, um, Amazon Prime, Disney Plus, all of the big international streamers. They were on this, you know, they were probably the biggest, steepest, curve you know they weren't even surveyed in the, the first time this went out and and i think 20 2014 and now and they were really surging but they've come back almost across the board so netflix is down from 42 percent uh daily reach to to 38 percent that's actually the biggest single drop between you know since last year disney plus is down from 14 to 13 amazon up from 10 to 11 the only really significant gainer is actually three now, which is up from 7% to 10%, but that's actually a 50% rise, albeit off of a low base. I wonder if we're, you know, there's a few different ways you can theorize about that, like 
Pivot is those are all paid platforms. You know, have people been cutting back, cycling off them? It, it's also, you know, we're still dealing with the aftermath of the of the writers' strike. Also, all a lot of those big spenders they were they were commissioning like six hundred plus new scripted series. They've come back massively from there. So, you know, and you know, so it could be that any one of these things, and there's just general kind of cost of living type type stuff happening there. So, yeah, really, really interesting. I mean, when you think about like yourself, how many are, are you sort of subscribed to, and what's your kind of relationship to the big streamers? So we have a Netflix subscription, which is part of our, I think, power uh, company deal. I can't say that I've logged in or watched a Netflix series or TV show in the last six months by choice. I think my partner, she sort of watches more Netflix shows than I do. If she's watching something interesting, then I'll, I'll tune in and, and jump on it. I think the last one we might watch was called Gentleman or something like that, like a British gangster thing um, by Guy Ritchie, which is quite cool. But I... I do not consume any shows on Netflix generally, Disney Plus, anything like that. I watch mostly, honestly, TVNZ Plus. I'm watching news and current affairs shows like Tangata Pacifica, Marae, Wakahuia, the odd episode. But yeah, really, I'm not active on Netflix or Disney Plus or anything like that. Throughout the weekend, my father-in-law is um, an avid watcher of rugby and rugby league, so that is what the TV is on. And if I can steal it to watch an episode of Marae or something like that, then I will. But otherwise, yeah, it's really not a go-to platform for me, which is, again, probably um, a bit of an outlier when you look at the 15 to 39 market or audience. But that's sort of my habit. Yeah, but it's interesting, right, as well. Like that that's such a strong local preference that, that you're displaying. And that is that is also something that those international platforms just have really not done here. Like in Australia, they've done a lot of commissioning, obviously huge amounts out of South Korea, Europe, um, the US. But because we're a small market, I wonder if they're going to kind of tap out unless they start to, to commission and that does become a bit of a fortress for the local platforms. Yeah, obviously a lot of it comes back to cost as well. Like we've seen the rebates slowly coming back into play. But they're, you know, with the economic... Um, conditions that we have at the moment, there, there's not really a great incentive for these massive streaming platforms to be creating local content here in Aotearoa. And TVNZ and the likes just don't have the sort of capital to invest into these types of shows. Um, they really struggle to justify spending $2 million on one episode of a locally produ produced piece of content when they can go and buy four or five episodes from overseas for the same price. And also something that I wanted to mention before was there's obviously a fragmentation and the continued sort of fragmentation that we've seen with these streaming platforms in terms of the content available. And so I think, again, with the economic conditions we have, people are really struggling to um, purchase or justify purchasing a subscription to something like Disney Plus just to watch The Bear, for example, which I was quite interested in watching. But... I couldn't justify purchasing a whole Disney Plus subscription just to watch this one TV show that I, I heard was interesting and wanted to watch, you know. So I think we're seeing a continuation of that. Yeah, that cycling in and out is definitely becoming a phenomenon. Um, what's your fourth pick? Um, so for my fourth pick, I've picked music, which is, again, a bit of a weird trend to see in the starter. But basically, we've got more people... Uh, listening to non-streamed music, so listening to things like CDs or vinyl instead of streaming on Spotify or something like that, uh, which is, again, really strange to see in, in the times that we live in for people to be choosing to to purchase a vinyl or listen to a physical CD, and I think there's a strong sense of nostalgia, obviously, with that. I'm a pretty avid vinyl collector, and I'm probably one of those snobs who thinks that the sound is better on vinyl than it is on a digitally produced piece of music, but there's something quite cool about um, having, you know, a piece of wax in your hand and putting that down and put, letting the needle play. And I'm often in the evenings picking up my baby and showing him a cover and putting the vinyl on and watching him buzz out at the music. So, yeah, I, I don't know. Obviously, not everyone's going to be listening to music for, for the same reason like that, but it is a really interesting trend to see. Yeah, that's. I totally agree. It's funny, right? Because the vinyl outsold CDs last year for the first time in a long time, and but both of them had a bounce back. You know, like there's been this real surge there, and the the sort of line on it from a lot of people in the music industry is that people are buying vinyl. Not actually, you know, over half of vinyl never gets opened. Is is a stat I've heard. But you know, if you go to like Real Groovy on a Saturday. Um, 
you could blink and think that you're back in the mid-90s in terms of the popularity of it. JB Hi-Fi does massive vinyl business now. So even if half of them aren't opening it, it's still... I don't know. The, you know, if you're trying to headline this whole survey, it's a little bit legacy uh, fights back, you know, and that the kind of, or oh, have we re- re- reached peak digital content kind of thing? And and um, certainly, like my kids, super into into vinyl. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm the same as you. Now, we're probably all atypical in a way, but uh, you know that that sense of physical media and having a profound uninterrupted engagement with a piece of content as opposed to just kind of blasting through it in kind of two or three seconds at a time. It, you know, this, this survey does tend to kind of back up some of that thesis. Um, my fourth pick um, also kind of speaks to that in a way. So we've got these 14 um, biggest platforms, which are the, they're the most popular platforms, and they're, you know, so that these go across, there's sort of four that sit in a bucket that you would, you know, that they is kind of user generated content, social media. There's five that are either linear or um, or sort of streaming for for local broadcast. There's three that are um, subscription video on demand, and then there's two that are audio forward. And of those fourteen platforms, uh, nine are either flat or declining, which again speaks to this. This is just so atypical. If you've been looking at this survey for a long time, all you've seen is the story of the digital platforms, of which you know probably a dozen of these are digital, 11 of them are digital, surging up and taking great chunks out of legacy platforms. And that just is no longer true, according to this data. The only, you know, like I said, three now, three now is up. TVNZ two is up, and they've had a long, long period of decline, slight declines for TVNZ one and TVNZ plus. But you know, given that these, you know, to to sort of zoom out a bit about what does this mean, a lot of media agencies, a lot of media buyers look hard at this survey as a bit of a test against what they're buying, and so I think you know if this forces a bit of a recalibration about the sort of just the shoveling of huge amounts of money to overseas platforms because right now you'd have to suggest that if you're going to follow this data and um, then you'd, you'd have to pull back there. Yeah, I think there'll be sort of some sense of joy and relief from those legacy media outlets when they see this data because like you say, people have been justifying shifting that spend to these global platforms for some time now because of what the data suggests. But now we're starting to see that sort of flatten or or slowly pull back. I think the New Zealand outlets in particular like TVNZ will really be celebrating today because they've been waiting a long time to stop the the sort of um, bleeding, stem the bleeding, so to speak. So, yeah, there will be some interesting conversations going on and obviously – TV has been aware and these legacy media outlets have been aware for some time that they need to change something. And obviously we're now seeing with the data that whatever they're doing, it's slowly starting to take effect and they might be figuring out how to sort of stem the, the flow of, of ads being going elsewhere. Yeah, I mean, that that's that's the headline out of this. And it's, you know, for an industry that is kind of on its knees right now and really sorely in need of some good news, this couldn't have come at a better time and couldn't be more profound in terms of, of what it says. Um, we're just about done here, but let's go with our, our last picks. Yours is about uh, something which I don't think you know many people would have picked, which is a lot of what we're seeing, to be honest, but it's about the way that the, the trends for 60 plus and the trends for 15 to 39, not necessarily the, the raw numbers, but the trends are starting to kind of look quite similar. Yeah, so... Just looking briefly at the data this morning, I noticed that the things that we've seen or the mediums that we've seen, the platforms we've seen increase for the 15 to 39 audience are kind of similar to what we've seen for the 60 plus. So we saw an increase for both audiences in terms of broadcast radio, podcasts. Uh, Gaming was a little uh, different. We sort of saw that flatten for the 60 plus, whereas for the 15 to 39, we saw a slight increase. Music, again, CDs and vinyl, that's increased. And we saw that sort of flattening off of, of SVOD and, again, global video sharing platforms, music streaming, linear TV was, again, another bit of a, a, a differentiator there in terms of the 15 to 39 linear TV decrease. But we saw that sort of slightly increase for the 60 plus. But overall, 
you wouldn't pick it, but they, they've actually matched each other in terms of the trends. Time spent, uh, we haven't had the chance to go through that yet. It is going to vary greatly. The, that 15 to 39 audience will be spending a lot more time gaming, for example, than the 60 plus. But overall, yeah, really interesting to note that the 40 to 59 audience is sort of an outlier in terms of what the trends are suggesting. Yeah, it's just, it's it's a really, it's it's funny because you, you'd say a, a survey that's broadly flat is is boring, but after a decade of huge change, this actually feels incredibly profound. The more, you know, we've literally had this for like an hour and a half and, it's, and you're sort of hearing us process it a bit live um, on mic and it is really staggering to me a lot of just, just how consistent this is because, you know, there is a lot of, a lot of people have issues with this survey and part of the issues they have is that it doesn't necessarily match to what the sort of more industry-specific surveys are, as, as I said earlier. But the fact that this is now starting to marry with that and they're starting to show real consistency year on year, I, I yeah, it feels like quite an important one. All right, for my last pick, this this one is um, – actually, you picked out, but it, uh, well, some element of it. But um, – we're looking at sources of news and what what we're seeing in terms of the the biggest news sources is quite different to what you see from Nielsen's digital survey. So I, I'm sure that the Herald will, you know, Shane Curry's going to have a, a media insight on this dropping at 10.30 tomorrow. You can bet that and who will look hard at this because what you're seeing is that they're, they're basically neck and neck in every Nielsen survey on a, on a monthly active users kind of basis. But in this survey, stuff is at 46% and the Herald at 35, which is stuff is back slightly, but it's still significantly ahead. The TV, TVNZ news, which has got the advantage of being both TV and online has, has just snuck ahead. Um, that's, that's in the top spot, but the most interesting part, I think, is is that as you said, that this this trust thing, which this is a different survey to the AUT survey, which and 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 it's methodologically different too. But the fact that stuff and TVNZ are tied in terms of consumption, but on a trust basis, TVNZ is picked by twenty two percent of people as its most trusted source, whereas stuff is eleven percent. So, you know, there's a lot of different ways you could read that. Part of me thinks that. Because TVNZ has this hour-long package, it has video. The hour-long package might have, you know, maybe fifteen items in it. Stuff is publishing hundreds of stories a day, and it there's something about an online news environment that encourages you to use particular techniques and publish particular stories that naturally don't do a lot for trust. And um, so it's quite interesting that that trust for digital platforms like news hub which is far below the others and you know obviously doesn't exist anymore though though um three news has functionally replaced it its trust is almost as high as the herald despite the herald being um a much higher penetration almost as high as stuff as well so yeah really really fascinating data there about how much video news um seems to encourage trust versus online news i think it shows that while digital news platforms are widely used we still have this level of trustworthiness associated with the traditional broadcasters like TVNZ and they maintain that reputation for trustworthiness and it obviously influences the way we behave especially in times of crises like we saw with COVID and, and the, the um, midday updates and that sort of stuff. When there's a big breaking event people for some reason default back to these big broadcasters like TVNZ. Um, so yeah it's really interesting to note that Stuff in TVNZ news are equally as popular, but when you look at the trustworthiness, TVNZ is just far beyond stuff. Yeah, it's 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 fascinating, and I, and I do sort of wonder if again, if you think about the the sort of dynamics of TV news, it's one of the last places that there is top down editorial control, and there is a story hierarchy that can't be avoided. You go to a digital news site, you've got a lead story, but you've got a thousand things competing for that attention and there's a lot of, of motion, a lot of data responding to that. So it's more like social in some respects than it is like a, a traditional kind of edited or, or, or hierarchy, story hierarchy piece of product like a newspaper or a magazine. And yeah, it, it 
just again, it's more revenge of legacy, which is just a, a really, really interesting take out from this. Um, now I'm looking through from the podcast studio at, at the chambers where we have all our meetings and I can see the editorial meeting happening. Um, so I'm going to let you go and get to that, Liam. Thanks so much for coming on the fold to, to talk about this survey. Kapo, it's been a pleasure. And um, yeah, a few things that we haven't yet been able to to crunch, but it'll be interesting once we get deep into the data. And yeah, it's a pleasure and an honour to be on the fold after listening to it for so long. So kia ora. Oh, kia ora, Liam. So, so good to have you on. Are you curious about how business can be better? I'm Simon Pound, and I host Business is Boring, a podcast where I caught it all with some of the most interesting people in entrepreneurship, commerce, and making things happen. Tune in to Business is Boring every Tuesday, brought to you by the Spinoff Podcast Network in partnership with Smart Business Lab. Kia ora, I'm Alex Casey, Senior Writer at The Spinoff. We wouldn't exist without the ongoing support of our generous members. If you're able to, you can make a donation at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. The Spinoff Podcast Network.